Hello, how are you doing? This week I'm going to share my top tips for improving your macro photography. Right, for regular viewers to the channel, you'll know I've done macro uh, photography videos before on here, and I also run macro photography workshops. And that got me thinking, what are the top things that I would tell a photographer who wants to get started in macro photography to get the biggest improvement quickly in their macro photography images? So anyway, without further ado, these are my top tips. Uh, let's get on with it. Right, so for tip number one, it's really a double tip, I suppose, and that's to shoot early and shoot calm. And what I mean by that is a lot of people think that, especially with things like insect photography, that um, you'll see that most insects are around and active on a hot sunny day towards the middle of the day. And that's not necessarily the best time to shoot them. What I mean by shoot early is you often find that a lot of insects are still around at that time early in the morning as soon as the sun comes up, but they're a lot more sluggish. And a sluggish insect is a lot easier to photograph than an active insect. And you will also find that at that time of the morning when you've still got dew on the leaves, you'll often find that you'll get insects that are inactive um, on leaves or on reeds, sometimes even covered with dew themselves. And they give you an opportunity for quite a unique shot. Um, and as I say, if it's early, they're not moving around, you will often find, particularly if you try and shoot things like damselflies and dragonflies in the middle of the day, they never stand still. And it's very, very difficult to get them in one position. You may find that early in the morning that there's a lot more chance of getting that shot where they'll stay in one position for longer. So first part of the tip is start shooting early. Yes, you can shoot into the middle of the day, there's no problem with that but you may find that your shots are better and you've got a better chance early in the morning. Now the second part of this tip, shoot calm. What does that mean? Well, you will also find that macro photography is difficult enough as it is, but if you try and shoot macro photography on a windy day, it's going to be extremely difficult. And here today we've got quite a lot of wind around, but what I've done is I've come into an enclosed area. So that just gives me an opportunity of getting insects, uh, butterflies, that sort of thing on plants, but I've not got the plant moving around. You'll find that it's difficult enough to try and get a steady, sharp shot. But if you're trying to photograph something very small with a very shallow depth of field, sometimes just a millimetre, even less than that, on something that's waving around, it is just very, very difficult. So, first tip, shoot early, shoot calm. You'll also find sometimes that the beginning of the day, when the sun's just come up, is the calmest part of the day. As you get towards the middle of the day, the wind starts to pick up, and then again, you've got that problem with trying to shoot some, a moving target on a moving target. So my second tip for you as a macro photographer would be to pay attention to your stance when you're actually taking an image. Um, and that's really important for a couple of reasons. You need a good solid base to stand on because if you're unbalanced in any way, that is gonna transfer itself to the camera. So obviously the way you hold the camera is important and you know you need to make that as comfortable for yourself as possible. Like here, I tend to have one hand underneath and slightly under the lens and then the other one where the shutter is. But the actual stance of how I'm standing for me is extremely important. And I'll just demonstrate that here. As you can see in this video, when I'm taking a picture of um, the top of this thistle head, I'm actually waiting for some insects to come onto there. What I'll do is I'll try and insert my foot forward. And you have to be careful with this because you want your foot further in front than you're actually standing at the minute because you're going to be rocking forward and if you keep your feet underneath you what you'll find is you're unbalanced and you'll fall forward and everything's tense if you can get that front foot into where you're eventually going to be and as i say you do have to be careful because you put in that foot where all the stems are of the insects or whatever that you're trying to photograph so if you just stick your foot in there and kick the bottom of the the, um, the plants or whatever, the insects are gonna be away. So you need to carefully put that front foot forward. And then when you move forward to actually take the shot, 
what you'll do is you'll start taking shots at a fair distance but then you'll gradually rock your way forward and eventually your weight will come onto that front foot and you won't be unbalanced and you'll have a lovely solid base and then you'll be close enough to take the images that you're after and that stance helps immensely with keeping the camera steady so yeah stance is extremely important just make sure that you've got that really strong base underneath you and that you're not starting from a position too far away and trying to lean in and then you're losing your balance. What I'd also say on stance is that breathing is obviously very important. There's a tendency to try and hold your breath when you're trying to take a shot like that. It's a little bit of false economy really because you, you could be there for quite some time and the more you hold the breath, your breath, the more tense you get and the more everything tenses up and then you know the more shaky you get. So really it's just a case of breathing steadily and slowly and calmly. Um, and then just taking those shots between breaths really uh, and then you'll find that you get a much steadier base and a much steadier hold on the camera and everything's steady all round really. Right my third tip is quite a simple one and that's to use manual focus on the camera. Now I know it's really really tempting especially if you're a beginner you've got a brand spanking new camera and it's got a super duper autofocus system to try and use autofocus but I've always found that for macro photography because you're really dealing with very fine margins, it's much easier to manual focus. So what I'll do is I'll have, have the camera on manual focus and then that allows me, by my own judgment, to judge when that eye is in focus. And I do that by also using the focus peaking on the camera. So that will give me a, a line. In my case, I use the colour red. So I'll have a red line that moves as it goes over the bit that's in focus. And when that red line goes over the eye, that's when I'm hitting the shutter and that's when I'm taking the shot. And I've found that, you know, I'll get a lot higher rate of shots that are in focus than trying to rely on the camera's autofocus, which if you imagine you've got a tiny insect, you're hitting a very small target, you've got a small box, even if you only use the middle focus point, that can quite easily move from the eye of a subject to a part of the antenna that's coming from near the eye, to the front leg, to the back leg, to part of the thing that the insect's standing on and you'll find that it's really really difficult to autofocus on the subject successfully so my third tip is try and get used to using manual focus you'll find it works much better so my next tip so my next tip is to do with focusing as well and actually it's linked to one of my previous tips remember where i said that i try and get one of my feet forward so i'm leaning into the subject like so that really helps with focusing now what I tend to do, I'm in manual focus, so generally when you're manual focusing you'll turn the manual focus ring to get something in focus. What I tend to do is keep the focus ring almost, if not at, the minimum focus distance. What I might do when I'm further away on a subject, as I'm coming in, I might have it further out, but I'll, I'll use what I call a rocking motion. So with this leg out front, it enables me to lean in and that motion there that just slight rocking i can move that focus peaking point over the subject in a way there's far less moving points i'm not trying to move into a subject change the focus ring that's all stationary so the only thing you've got to worry about is just that motion and watching that red line and hitting the shutter it's a lot easier than trying to turn the focus ring, lean in, hit the shutter. One less thing to worry about. And you just rock slightly backwards and forwards over your subject. And every time that the eye is in focus, you just hit the shutter and a burst of shots. Again, I've found that that gives you a lot higher hit rate with getting shots in focus. <laughs> Now our next tip is one that maybe if you've been doing macro photography for a while is something that you might want to try out. It's a little bit more expense but that is to use a flash. Now this is um, not an expensive flash. I think it cost me about 60-70 quid. Um, but what a flash enables you to do, what you're always struggling against with macro photography is that you've got a small depth of field 
So what that means is you might need to have a aperture of f8. So these macro lenses, a lot of them will go down to f2.8 or even less. What that means is the depth of field is absolutely minuscule. So by going to f8, you give yourself probably a couple of millimetres. But what do you do if you're on a day like today where it's clouded over and you're struggling for light? So what you'd have to do then is take your ISO right up. You then need a fast enough shutter speed to freeze the subject. So if you've got a quite a fast moving insect, if your, um, your thing that the insect is on is moving around as well, you're trying to freeze that. So you, are you gonna get enough light? So by, what happens is if you use a flash, the actual flash freezes the subject. So in essence, you shoot at, at the maximum the flash will shoot at, I think this is 1 250th of a second, and it's the actual light from the flash that freezes the subject, which means that I can go up to f8, still get that depth of field, I can um, shoot at a reasonable ISO, so I might have 200, 300 ISO, something like that, and I'm not having to worry about getting enough lighting because the flash is taking care of that. And as you'll see here, I've got this diffuser, diffuser on. This is a, a new diffuser that I'm using today. Um, and it's one I've been quite impressed with. I will put a link in the description below of uh, where I got this one from. It's not that expensive. Um, if I just get, this is my old one. As you can see, it's getting a bit battered and torn now. And what I found with this one is that I'm having to sort of hold it on. So the lens goes through that hole there. And it just seems a lot of the area is wasted just for covering that flash and diffusing the light a little bit. So I've gone with this one. The other reason I've gone with this one is that it's quite compact. So I'm still getting that diffused light, but I'm not um, having such a big thing that's leaning into something. If you can imagine when you're trying to do macro photography, the more stuff you've got coming off here and into the subject, the more likely it is to get it to move away. Plus you're often got other things around you that you might knock into your subject. So the more compact, the better. Right, so if we take a look at the back of the flash here and turn it on, um, you'll see in the top left here, um, there's the, man the manual mode it's denoting there. That's what I generally shoot in. You can switch around between modes, but manual is the one I use. At the bottom right here is the length of the lens that you're using. It says here 105 millimeter. That's as close as that I can get for this 90 millimeter lens on this flash. And then what I'm also doing is looking at the power of the flash that I'm going to be using now. One to one is full power, which I never use. Generally, I'm at a 16, 32 or 64th of the power. And that's generally enough to get the job done. Um, obviously, on certain days, you'll need to move that around. This is just really to give you an idea of somewhere to start. Tip number six, and it's something that you tend to forget about in macro photography because you're so intent on getting that thing in focus and that tiny little thing and all those little small margins. But what you need to remember also is that composition is important. And composition is just as important as if you're doing something like landscape photography. So take a look at these images here and I'll just explain a little bit about what I mean. Right, so if you take a look at this first image, the first thing you'll notice is that it obeys the rule of thirds. Now this is a landscape photography technique that is often used, not exclusively, but basically what that says is that these intersections of the lines here is where you should try and put your main point of interest because naturally the viewer's eye gets drawn to these points. What I've also done to try and help that is, as you can see, the beetles on this grass stem and I've tried to bring it in as close as possible from this top right corner and then obviously leading out bottom left. Um, that's not obviously always possible, but that line is designed to lead the viewer's eye directly to the main point of interest being the beetle here. Right, as you can see from this second image, I've not obeyed the rules of thirds particularly. This is on the line, the top line, but it's not on an intersection of a line. The main point of interest being the eyes of the dragonfly here. But what you will notice is I've got this leading line coming up from the bottom right corner and heading off towards the top left. And also even the wing here of the dragonfly is also creating a leading line up to this main point of interest being these fantastic eyes. So you don't have to always obey these rules. They're really just guidelines. Um, but what they do do is help you sort of um, improve your composition uh, and once you're really comfortable with looking at these rules and using them, these guidelines, then you can start breaking them um, 
in a more creative way but yeah I think this works really well with this subject because the the eyes of this dragonfly are so prominent that uh, yeah we really do want them central in the scene. So when you've started to nail a lot of these techniques we look at something like composition the next thing that you would also want to consider is something like colours. Now it's not something that comes to your mind straight away but soon you will start to look at a subject and think what does that look like with its background or does that look good on what it's sat on does it contrast or does it complement that subject so I've got a couple of images here to show you where colour is really important and it can set the mood for the image it can set the tone for the image um, it can you know make an image really stand out or one that's calmer and more of a a slow journey through an image rather than a bang there's your subject wow that really stands out and when you start to look at colour you can then start to think more about your images before you actually take the shot and think what would look great on here would I are they is that subject coming to here can I engineer it so it's coming to here can I wait um, and wait till that subject's on here rather than taking it on this plant here that you, which is a you know doesn't really go with it and one thing you can do to, to sort of get a more a better appreciation of colour and how it works is get something like an artist colour wheel and uh, so probably not something as big as this one but this really gives you a great idea of what colours match and what which colours contrast and how you can use those colours together and if you have that in mind or even take a smaller one of these with you this one's a bit big uh, for illustration purposes only but a small one of those just gives you a little bit of an idea when you're in the field and you can start to see those colours and how they mix and match and right you... so this tip here is is sometimes a real bugbear with me and it is with macro photography please 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 take your time I see this a lot when people first come to my macro photography workshops it's often a case of um, they'll see an insect on a flower they'll get in there the image is sharp um, it's in focus they'll take the image they'll move on to the next done we've done with that and what they'll often get is an image that is sharp and in focus yes but is that the image that they'd put on the wall probably not if they continue on like that they'll probably come away with 10 or 20 images that are nice images but they're not outstanding images and what I always say to them is that I'd rather you spend all day on one subject and get that image that you go wow I want that on my wall and they only do that by spending time and as a as a an example of that you know if you if you see a a plant where the insects a certain type of insect is coming to that plant all the time you might be tempted to wait and get it yeah it's on the plant bang that plant might have various flower heads some might be a bit you know they might have something in the background behind them that's distracting there might be one that's slightly higher and has got a lovely background but not, nothing is landing on it at that point in time and I will say to people well wait for it to go they will go on that eventually set up and wait and wait for that insect that butterfly that moth whatever to land on the one you want it to and then make that your shot so in, in, in a way visualize your shot before the subject gets there and really really wait it out until that happens rather than settle for something that's second best and what you'll find is that you, your shots then are elevated to that next level so really really the very important tip really is to take your time with your shooting and just visualize that shot in your mind the shot that you want the shot that you see on your wall and really don't settle for anything less it might take you more time you might spend all day on one subject but believe you me if you get that cracking shot at the end it'll make it much much worth more uh, worth it than those 10 shots that are yeah they're nice they're all in focus but you know they're nothing special well i hope you've enjoyed this week's tips video if you have please me leave me a comment in the comments below um, if you do take any images using any of these tips or any images at all actually whether wildlife landscape macro anything like that um, even you know things like street photography I'd steer you towards the Scott Tilly photography group on Facebook it's a really really lively active group on there and the main thing is it's a friendly group there's not um, 
there's no critique of the images, not unless you ask for an image to be critiqued. And really, you know, we've got photographers on there who are a professional level who, um, you know, put some outstanding images on there. And then we've got people who just want to walk with the camera phone in the morning while they're walking the dog or whatever and, and snap images and they stick them on there. And if people like them, they'll give them a thumbs up. It's just somewhere for people to display their images that, that they like, really. So, yeah, I would steer you across to that. Um, if you've really enjoyed this video and you want to see more macro photography videos, well, there's another one up here. Um, and also, if you've not uh, subscribed to the channel yet, then hit that button over there. As always, give this one a thumbs up. I'll see you next time for another one.